So this is Jacob, and he's going to talk about Go stuff. Yep. Go stuff. Thank you, Grant. Uh, yes, um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, interoperating with um, uh, web uh, development in uh, GoLang. Um, so just a little bit of history. Um, I am uh, developing a um, open source uh, modular software um, synthesizer for uh, making sort of musical uh, content and that sort of things. Um, it's a replacement for uh, some legacy uh, software that I've got, which is on uh, now about a 15-year-old uh, uh, code base. And as you can see, it's looking rather dated. <laughs> um, what's going on there is the red bits are where I play my guitar and the green bits are where it plays it back in a looping sort of arrangement. Um, so the uh, technology refresh will um, uh, has a few aims. One is to actually just replace that legacy uh, platform. Um, but number two is actually be somewhat of a social project that I can actually kind of share and uh, present on the uh, web and uh, that sort of thing. And um, actually concentrate on quality. It's been quite a long time actually getting this started, um, but I'm on a roll now. Um, so my long-term ambition for this is a uh, sort of benchmark is a wonderful product called uh, Reactor, where you can sort of just build up this uh, graph of uh, processes and uh, actions and uh, have that signal throw through it. It'll be some time before it's at that level, but uh, step by step. Um, so my technology uh, implementation choice in this uh, case is Golang, and the reason for that after quite a bit of uh, hunting around was um, it's the best language that I can find that has a very large variety of uh, compile targets. Um, so I can build native code where performance matters, um, but you might be aware that uh, Golang has a, um, a, a very efficient um, JavaScript uh, transpiler where you can take that code and actually run it in a, uh, in a web browser, and it's uh, very compatible. Um, so because of those uh, compile targets, I can kind of you know, jump up to a more interpreted language or jump down to a more uh, compiled one, and that makes it really quite attractive. Sorry, that's Golang compiles into JavaScript? Yes, that's correct. Um, so there's a project called uh, Go4JS, um, which will uh, uh, directly produce uh, JavaScript that you can you now run in the browser. Um, it does a very good job of uh, emulating the uh, Go uh, runtime as well. So things like um, its uh, networking APIs and things just work out of the box. And, yeah, which is, uh, which is really good. Um, so my user interface dilemma. Um, now that I've decided that I want to write a um, uh, uh, native application and I want to run it in a web browser, <laughs> I somehow need to find a way that I can build a user interface um, that will run everywhere that I need it. Um, so this is a real problem uh, because the natural solution is to just build a web-based user interface, but then the question is how do I run that in my native application? So back to that in a little bit. Um, so at this point I've um, decided what my project is. Um, I've decided on my implementation language and I've got a pilot implementation which we don't have enough time to look at tonight, but it can actually play notes. Um, and I need to run it on uh, at least uh, Windows and uh, Linux native targets, have a common uh, user interface for um, all of them, um, and a, a web-based interface would seem like the most natural thing to do. Um, so some of the questions I'm asking myself at this point about how I approach this problem are, um, do I just actually make some compromises and say it, it won't have a user interface on some platforms? Um, because this is a musical product, and it makes uh, audio um, primarily, um, when it's being used in, say, a you know, performance uh, context, you might not actually need a user interface. Um, I decided pretty early on that that just wasn't really going to be usable. I wanted uh, everything to work everywhere. Um, the next approach would be to use a conventional uh, REST API um, and actually do a client-server architecture where I run the um, native code in the background, uh, backend, and I have a web interface that just uh, calls back and forth uh, in the way that a conventional web application uh, would. I decided against that approach fairly early on um, for the reason that um, it was just going to be too high maintenance, being that uh, absolutely every resource that I had in that backend product uh, was going to need uh, to have an endpoint written for it and managed and maintained. It was just going to be a lot of work. Um, so the other thing that I looked at was using uh, low-level graphics, and that's uh, basically just give me a frame buffer, give me a big array of pixels, I'll write into that, and then I can run my user inter uh, interface everywhere. Uh, problem with that approach is that um, 
uh, I would need to either build up uh, a very large user interface library from scratch or port one, and that really didn't seem very practical. Um, so next step, actually look at uh, some of the options available for um, Golang um, user interface. So as you can see from that list, um, it's a very active space, um, but there's no clearly established um, standards at this point. Um, so I could probably actually triple or quadruple the length of that list and just sort of be about right for the number of projects which are trying uh, to crack the problem of uh, doing web development in Golang. Um, it's got great potential for that. Um, Golang has uh, recently acquired a, a WebAssembly uh, target as well as the uh, JavaScript one. So again, you can be writing a source base which is very convenient for server-side development uh, and actually being, uh, doing user interface development on that same uh, source space uh, as soon as that um, problem of how you interact um, with the, uh, the, the browser DOM is, is cracked. Um, so it's a moving space. So um, here's my answer. Um, in the process of doing my diagrams for these, I um, was looking for a tool and then I found that I could just put dots on the end of the line and, and do ASCII text start. <laughs> Um, and as a bonus, it kind of looks like it came out of a 1980s printer. <laughs> so <laughs> here's the, the, um, the approach in a nutshell. Um, I've even got a mouse pointer there. Um, we have a server, which is native code, running our application. Uh, we have the browser. They are connected by a web socket, which is, if that sounds clunky, it is. Um, and when you interact with the user interface, it sends user interface event mess messages back to your server. And in the uh, other direction, um, it sends updates um, of what's changed in the user interface back to the browser, which then get updated. So, at this point, we will tempt the demo gods. Hopefully people can see a little bit of that. Um, yeah. That even works. All right. Cool, there we are. Um, so in Golang, if you don't uh, specifically um, implement an interface, if you can do it, then you are one. Um, so render is a interface. If your receiver can implement it, then you can be one. And that method is basically just returning um, a definition of um, effectively HTML uh, elements at the end. So we can just build them up in that syntax. There's a div, so forth and so forth. Okay. Long lines here. I should, yeah, yeah. Really um, put a shortcut to this or you'll use two hands. Um, okay, so that is now running. Right, and here's our classic uh, to-do example. Um, so this is used in... Um, it's kind of obligatory for any React-like framework. Uh, the reason for it is that um, it's 
at face value pretty trivial, but it actually shows some things which are quite difficult to, uh, to do um, with non-declarative uh, frameworks, such as adding an item, and we see that check count updates. With you know, this example's been done to death, so I won't bore you with that. But um, just to see what's going on here, if I Uh, open a second window there, we'll just see that those two are not following along. They almost are, okay. <laughs> right, but um, some debugging required, but that's the basic principle. Uh, and just to make it a little bit more clear exactly what's going on. Right, so I've um, just sort of clicked on that checkbox and we see that a click event's been generated and sent and a patch has been uh, sent back. Um, which uh, just contains that update uh, text there. So that's the basic principle. Um, so just moving on to the second example. Cool. Um, that's uh, fired up an audio server, it's run my application, and it's uh, made a couple of connections. So things which are very much not happening in the web browser. Um, and if we now have a look at our application. Right, we've got a non-screen keyboard, and if I play the keys, there's a small amount of non-musical audio coming out the front. Um, <laughs> but we can also see if we play the keys here that they come through as well. So um, uh, that is um, how you put a web-based um, front end on your Golang um, implementation in Go. So, thanks. <laughs> All right. And if I'm not holding anyone back from virtual pizza. No, you're not. Yep. Um, the, sh the short answer is that it will just need to be very um, intimately bound and um, resource ready to make this work. So um, uh, using a WebSocket is probably not the final um, solution. Um, what I will most likely do is actually um, build an, uh, have an embeddable uh, browser engine like um, Electron or something like that, which lets me actually um, quite directly uh, manipulate the DOM uh, context. And uh, there's um, uh, anywhere that there's a, uh, a networking protocol involved, um, there's, there's going to be indeterminism. So making, making this work in an environment where you're not 100% sure that that communication channel is reliable just isn't going to work. Um, but that, that will be the approach, which is basically embedded, embedded browser engine. Yeah, um, how, how to do it on um, embedded systems, so that's a really good question because um, that's one of the other targets that I do want for this, um, this work. Yeah, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a Golang or um, the ESP32s or the Arduinos that are using yep. Python micro Python server. Yep, yep. Um, Go does have um, some compiled. Go um, can uh, target GCC, um, so basically at, the, um, uh, at that point you can um, uh, target embedded sy um, systems. Uh, your large problem there is that um, it does have a fairly substantial runtime, uh, and that um, might sort of exclude it from some of those um, smaller microcontrollers. But as soon as you start getting up to the 32-bit ones, then you know they've, they've actually got the resources to do it. So. Yeah. 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 
Yep. Um, surprisingly enough, I mean, um, the, the actual the, the web-based um, audio path of this actually works really well, um, but when you really want that performance, it's, it's going to be a, a native target. Sure. I love it. Um, yeah, um, I've been uh, working on this project. Um, it's kind of a weekend project, but, um, you know, on and off for the last year, and uh, the more I see, the more I like. I haven't yet met a, um, a, a problem I can't solve with it. Favourite parts is the type system, um, yeah. Yeah, head and shoulders. Um, the, uh, the, the reason for that is that um, you can really sort of um, dial it up and um, down between a, a very strongly statically typed system and a much more dynamic one. Really? Um, well, with, with the uh, interface definition, I mean, for example, looking at those, um, when we had that uh, DOM builder, and I'm sort of saying, build me a, yeah. This might actually be on, there we go. So, um, you know, I'm, that's a variadic function. It's just taking whatever. If I, if I chuck it pairs of strings, it um, puts an attribute pair in. If I chuck another, say, event handler in, it handles that. So basically, it's, um, any, any data type, including the primitive, uh, primitives, can behave as the empty interface. And then you can just receive that and do a type position and then cast it back to what you need. Right. So um, the, the thing about like type wars and saying you know, a, a type language is better or a statically type um, language is all dynamically with type ones, it's, um, it's kind of a false argument because it really depends what problem's immediately in front of you. Um, so actually having the ability to sort of wind that up and down um, as needed is, is really convenient. It's <sighs> the worst thing. The good, what's, 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 good and, nah, what's good and bad is, I mean, it's, it's very opinionated about how you want to do things, but I'd, I'd actually really sort of call that a, a, a plus. There's, there's times that I kind of fight it and then give up and say... Mm. Yep, okay, your, your opinion's pretty strong on that and I'm not going to win, so I'll just, I'll just go with it. <laughs> uh, Using the choice to learn something new, yep. I, and I was kind of picking between Rust and yep. Go, and I got a little bit through the Go book, and then I was looking at Rust, and I played with Rust, and I think I chose Rust purely because yep. it wasn't written by Google. But right. Have you, have, you, have you played with both? You uh, a little. Um, I think I, I settled on Go fairly early on. The, the, actually, the original pilot for this was actually in Kotlin. Um, and I moved away from um, because Kotlin has uh, quite um, complete uh, JavaScript transpiler as well. Um, I moved away from that because I couldn't get native code out of it or not. Um, that would run at any um, uh, decent performance. Um, another big, if it was talking embedded systems, another big um, positive with um, Go is that um, its um, ability to interact with um, C and C++ code is really good. Um, so the native audio drivers are written in C and you can just basically call methods into them and pass data structures back and forth and all the things you expect to work and it just does. One, one thing I really liked about Go is that you can compile a single binary that runs on multiple applications. Yep. That's amazing. So you're like, here is my yep. little crappy little bird that does the whole system. Put it on your MIPS router, yep. put it on your ROM router. Right. Um, uh, also that you can uh, actually produce a static package of absolutely everything that you need and that you know is going to be consistent on the, um, uh, the target platform that you're putting it to. Uh, that story on um, uh, you know, Python, for example, is quite a bit more difficult because you have all that dependency management to deal with and the, the ability for ex especially small things like microservices and, uh, services and so forth to actually be able to just build a static binary and know that everything's in it and that it's going to run on your target um, is, is quite attractive. Um, so, for example, that um, demo that was um, on before, um, that has some uh, embedded cascading style sheets and things like that. So again, those are um, statically compiled uh, into the binary, and um, there's no distribution question to, to have there. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Um, yeah.